Well, I'm home alone. Chickens at the door, cat on the table, dog on the couch, goats, horses. <laughs> uh, but it's empty house, so it's easy for me to make a video share in here today. And I got so much to do. But anyway, um, cracked open the email and I don't know how many people, I, had a, I don't know how many, there's dozens of emails in there with the title over the email, um, here's your stabilized version of the video from yesterday. So that's interesting. So I'll, I'll download one of those and share that. What else? I'm not quite awake yet. <laughs> Got a couple friends over for uh, a few beers in the man cave last night. A little slow and groggy, but uh, what else, what else, what else? I think that's about it right now. I gotta go, uh, it's got fresh snow, so it's a little foggy out, but I'm gonna go up to the mountains for sure and take a camera with me and have a peek around up there. Maybe tomorrow. I got, I got too much stuff to do here today. Oh, that's what I was gonna say. Um, I, I get, I don't know how many podcast offers I've had past handful of years and you know what I think I've only done one it's just never uh, it's obviously not on the top of my list I'm not against it it's just not on the top of my list but when it comes to this topic I'm not really that enthusiastic about hitting anybody's podcast because I stated before it's if I could only if I could bring all of you because it's not about me this topic this what's going on here is not about me and I don't need to promote me on numerous channels so this is 100% about all the people. <clears throat> like I said earlier, this, what's going on here is a prime example, an easy example of what happens when the people get hurt and the power that comes with it, right? And that's very, very important, especially for what's going on today. And um, I'll bite my lip right there because I'm in the mood to, get, to, go, uh, to go off <laughs> in a way with various topics right now. But. Later in time, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of good people who care doing a lot of things to make things better. Let that be known. Anyway, so what I meant to say before I went on that tangent was a young fellow from British Columbia, a very enthusiastic hunter, has asked me to be a guest on his podcast and talk hunting, specifically black-tailed deer, I think. So I agreed. <laughs> so I will do that either this evening or tomorrow evening. And I'll let you guys know Maybe I'll post a link up to it in the community page or something, whatever. All you people that are curious of that topic, want to hear uh, what we want to talk about on that topic, I'll, I'll make that available for you guys to watch as well, all right? Anyway, let me get a couple email shares out here while I'm sitting here slugging back a coffee, and I will go to the editing program here behind me, and I'll download one of those, whoever's first in line, Whoever's first in line with the uh, the stabilized version, I'll 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 share it. All right. But what do we got here? In the meantime, more info about 1996 moose hunt Keg River, Alberta. Thank you for your time and your efforts for bringing the truth out from mankind for the world to hear. In 1970, my dad bought a house from the Catholic Church or the Catholic Diocese. Three-story house with a basement. Us kids found out that the house was haunted. Almost all of us children have had experiences in that house. My mother was sick with lupus and arthritis, which had crippled her. My mother turned to Indian medicine to try to heal herself and to help with the pain. She was a residential school survivor, and I am a 60s scoop survivor. I would have, I would have nine night terrors, and I would also see a tall priest all in black. We found out later the Catholic diocese, diocese were taken. The unwanted babies in the 60s. Whatever that priest was doing to those babies and the nuns was pure evil. I didn't know then what was in that house. It had eventually turned my mother's medicine bad. From when I was 9 till 13, I was in and out of the house group homes, foster care, before they took me and put me in lockup youth assessment centers, detention centers. My mother asked me to take 
that shell that was her medicine. Tie it up with a ribbon and hang it up in the tree as far as I could climb. I was young and naive and did not listen to her. I threw it inside an old grain elevator. That's when the demon attached itself to me. I lived with it and fought it until I turned 32, when it just about killed me. My sister lives in Lethbridge, Alberta, and became a, became a pipe carrier. One night, her and her friend had almost the same dream. The young man was fighting for his life against a dark entity. The next morning, they talked about it, pulled their money together, and pulled their money together, didn't know where they were going, and drove to Fairview, Alberta, and found me. The next day, we drove back to Lethbridge. Then my sister had two medicine men work on me. They arranged for me to go for a two-day sweat in Montana. The night before we left Montana, that demon attacked me. It, was about, it just about suffocated me. I called out to Jesus with my whole heart and nothing but faith, and he came to me and saved my life. The next day, we went to Montana to do the ceremony so I could, so I could properly give my mother's medicine back, and it was done. That was the first time I met Jesus. The second time is when I helped my Uncle Bobby on the trap line in 2016. I was taken to heaven, and that's where I met Jesus. I asked Jesus, what do I do with this knowledge? Jesus said, tell your testimony to people so they know the truth, that my Father is real and I am alive. I said to Jesus, I am scared. What if they don't believe me and judge me? Jesus said, what would be worse for you to be judged by man or to be judged by my Father and risk your soul? So now, I don't care who I testify to, and it always feels good. This was finally revealed to me that a demon had possessed that priest. The priest was doing, was doing unspeakable things to those babies and the nuns. I'm not sure when that priest had died. All I know that it was before we moved to that house. My story has been corroborated by my family. It is true. I'm now a 53-year-old single parent. My son is 11 years old and is a pure gentleman. I'll write you another email to tell you the rest of my story about the twin Sasquatches and the mother that I saw in 1996 west of Keg River, Alberta. Many blessings to you, sir, and keep up the good work. Amen. All right. There's another, I have another email attached to this, all right? So I guess I should have read this one first. So let's get into this one, you guys. Please share. My clan has township upon township of trap lines that carry on to the Chinchaga Forester Trunk Road from two and a half hour drive west of Keg River. We were staying in my great uncle's cabin on his trap line. His cabin is about 200 meters from the Keg River or Keg Creek. That is what is turned into from all the farmland. That will come into play a little further into the hunt. There is my uncle Bobby, my uncle Clarence, and two of my great uncles. The first day of our hunt, my Uncle Bobby said he knew of a good moose crossing five kilometers away from the cabin. I said, let's go check it out. We got to the cut line and noticed hunters had camped, had a camp set up a little ways in and they were breaking camp. We stopped in and asked how their hunt went. They said good, but something was stealing their meat and they had a quartered and that they had quartered and hung on poles. They said a grizzly came in last night and took a quarter in the rain. I looked for tracks while my Uncle Bobby talked to them. I couldn't find no tracks at all, and I thought that was so strange. Anyway, the hunters were spooked and were getting out of there. We continued down the cut line to the end where there is a wellhead. We called for moose down there, but nothing called back or showed up. So we decided to come back early in the morning and went hunting somewhere else. We got nothing the first day, so we headed back to the cabin. During supper, my Uncle Clarence told us he had seen the biggest grizzly bear that he has ever seen, a sow with two cubs. He said they're eating something by the tree line. And when the bear stood up, he said it was about 13 feet tall, but he said in Cree, he couldn't see its snout. When we have some humong now we have some humongous brown bears on a trap line, and he has spent his whole life out there. So we believed him. The next day we decided to go camp out on the southeast corner of trap line. There was an old plywood cabin back there. We're gonna go camp in that we we're gonna go camp in. On the way there, I stood up in the back of the truck. I had my 30 odd six cradled in my arms, and my arms were rested on top of the cab. When we came to a curve, when we came to a creek, 
a slight downhill, then back up to a curve in the road. We came up on a huge black bear that was dead right by the tree line. When we came to stop, we seen an enormous silver tip grizzly running off to our left. We got out to look at the black bear and we noticed the paws were cut off and the gut was opened up with a knife. Someone killed this 500 pound magnificent black bear for paws and gallbladder. That goes on a lot where I live. I said a prayer and dropped tobacco for this poor bear. Two kilometers away from the black bear was the plywood cabin. It was unlivable, so my uncle said we just put a trap on the ground and a trap over top of ourselves. What? It was unlivable, so my uncle said we just put a tarp, it must be a tarp because he said trap, sorry, on the ground and a tarp over top of ourselves. Their logic was there was a 500 pound black bear to eat two kilometers away, so the grizzly had lost to eat, lol. It rained the next day, so we drove and went and called, called at certain areas. We drove up a shitload of wolf. We drove up to a shitload of wolf tracks on the road, and you could see they were running and chasing a moose. The tracks went off to the left, and we stopped, got out, and had a look around. Oh, my uncle likes to tease, so we started calling like a wolf, and wouldn't you know, he scared seven wolf pups out of the bush about 15 feet from where we were. We jumped into the truck and started following them. They ran in front of the truck, and as they got tired, they started to pull over and sit in the ditch. There's one beautiful black and gray that looked on a that looked on a blue hue that took on a blue hue to the fur. I told Uncle to stop and let's see what it does. It ran for another hundred meters, stopped and looked back at us, and trotted off into the bush, all proud as heck. Uncle said, what a smart ass. He said it would be a, a leader, lol. The pups are around three feet high and what a wonderful experience. We also seen a huge crane on the road and it had one hell of a time trying to get up the ground. Uncle Bobby said he must have ran out of gas when we were driving on his runway. Anyway, we had no luck so we went back to camp. The next day, my Uncle Bobby knew where there was a beaver dam up in the hills. So him and I and my great uncle hunted our way up there. We got there around 4 p.m. We had to leave the quads 300 meters away from the beaver dam and walk in. We were about 100 meters from the dam and something tore up everything for the rest of the way. There were three to five inch poplar trees that were ripped out of the ground, root and all turned upside down and the tops shoved back in the root hole. There were breaks about 12 to 13 feet up the tops left hang in there. They were breaks that were twisted and broken in several places. There was logs, old rotten logs tossed all through the cut line that were willows that were pulled up handfuls at a time and throwing around up in the trees. In F incredible. My great uncle was scared. My uncle Bobby thought it was a moose. I said I'd never seen a moose make this kind of damage. What convinced me as a Sasquatch was the brakes at about 13 feet up and then the brakes that were twisted and broken and twisted in different areas. That didn't deter my uncle Bobby. We made our way to the start of the beaver dam and it was quite a big lake, very beautiful, but I noticed there was no ducks, no birds, singing, no squirrels, no ravens, nothing quiet as heck. Uncle started calling. We waited half an hour. We got a couple of knocks back. And Uncle Bobby was convinced it was a huge bull, Robin. So we called it again and this time we got a huge knock and it was closer. My great uncle told Bobby, let's get the hell out of here. It was starting to get dark by now and Uncle Bobby thought he was going to tease, so he called again. Wouldn't you know, we heard the loudest knock we ever heard in the bush. My great uncle said, I'm leaving. You can stay. So we followed him and got the hell out of there. The next morning we decided to hunt our way back to the cabin. I was standing in the back of the truck again with the gun cradled in my forearms. My elbows rested on the cab of the truck. We made our way to the dead black bear and we caught that huge silver tip coming into the kill. It turned around and ran back from where I came. We drove past the kill, started going around the turn and, and down to the creek crossing. Then off to the right I see a head coming up above the top of the willows. Then I see its massive shoulders. We are looking each other in our eyes. Then I heard in my head, what? The look in the Sasquatch eyes was startled. 
and uh, was of startle and confusion. I banged on top of the cab of my uncle, and my uncle stopped, and I jumped up. I could hear it run off. I didn't bother to go in because the willows and alders were too thick. I did have a look to see how tall the willows were, and I figured they were 9 to 11 feet tall. So if I could see the shoulders of this massive animal, well, you do the math. Part 2. The next day, my Uncle Bobby and I decided to go hunt the moose crossing five kilometers away from the cabin. We got in there early in the morning, parked the trikes, then proceeded to call. We stood there for about an hour and a half, then something called back. We called it in. We could hear it coming to us, then it stopped. We waited for about half an hour, and then my uncle decided to walk about 40 feet away from the guns, from the guns to listen. As he started walking back to me, this two-year-old bull walks out behind him about 80 meters. I hand, I hand singled my uncle. Well, I hand s signaled my uncle that there was a moose behind him. He hand signaled to me to bring his gun. I can't take the shot because my uncle's standing between us. So I used my uncle as a blind and I crouched down and got his gun to him without being seen. My Uncle Bobby turns around and I and shot. I could see a tuft of hair fly in the air. Uncle said, son of a bitch. The moose started to run across the cut line. He shot it again and that epping moose went sideways and fell into a stand of red willows and went down. And those epping willows pushed them back up. The damnedest thing I ever epping saw. Then it ran off. Of course it went to a blowdown that was about four feet high. Ooh. My uncle then, my uncle could not track this one because of his knees. I always train myself to walk as quiet as possible in the bush so I have a good blood trail and it was nothing for to stay on top of the blow, it was nothing for probably, it was nothing for me to stay on top of the blowdown. I was in a stand of poplar trees then I started to get into the muskeg, small spruce trees. I was roughly 150 yards away from that poplar stand. Then I noticed this really odd game trail. It was about two feet wide and about a foot deep. I've only seen a game trail like that once before back in 89 when I used to do heli portable line slashing. I used to do gas and oil exploration in the mountains, BC and Alberta. The blood trail started going down this path. So I followed it to the tree line, started going back to the right, same as the game trail. The game trail was turning to my left and I could hear ravens up ahead. That is when I smelled it. The wind was blowing on my back. It's hard to describe the smell. It wasn't a rotten smell, but it sure had a distinct smell. Musky kind of reminded me of my uncles when they would go on a two-week bender and not wash themselves. Honestly, that's how it smelled. I turned around and I seen what looked like something had bent these willows and alders and shoved the tops into the muskeg. It looked like a round hut and there were small spruce trees on top of it with logs crossed on top and the roots still attached to them and there was a dug up muskeg all around the bottom of it. That's when I saw it. I had a hard time making out what it was. At first I thought it was a grizzly kill because I thought I could see a moose head sticking out but there was no nose or snout but I could see what looked like moose teeth. There were no canines, just big molars, and the front looked like human teeth. Then I seen it blink. As soon as it blinked, everything came into focus. What I saw was this huge Sasquatch laying on its side, propped up on its elbow, looking at me. I think it was smiling. And then I heard a heavy, deep laughter in my head, and he said, what are you doing here? I was perplexed. I remember what my elders told me. If you ever get into trouble in the bush, keep wind to your nose. That's what I did. I wasn't running, but I was walking fast. And as soon as he couldn't see me, I went behind that structure and ran towards that blowdown. I'll tell you, I ran on top of those logs like it was nothing. I ran to where I started. My Uncle Bobby was waiting for me on the cut line. He started laughing and said, that's the fastest I've ever seen a man run out of the bush. I never told him what I saw. I just told him I ran into grizzly kill with bury, which buried the moose. The next morning he wanted to go back in there. So when we got to the area where I come out, there were two poplar trees broken, about 12 to 13 feet up on, on both trees with the top still connected. We got the heck out of there and hunted some other area. Part three. Two days after my run into the Sasquatch, 
our last day of the hunt, my uncle and I had one trike with a trailer hooked up to the back that you could sit in. We were around 10 kilometers from the cabin hunting a beaver dam. We got nothing there and started to go back to the cabin. We were about four kilometers from the cabin and he wanted to check out another area. I told him I will go back to the cabin and start supper. About 800 meters from the cabin there is a dugout. On the other side of the dugout there is a beaver house. There are willows in the ditch and as I come up to the dugout I could see what I thought was two bear cubs on the beaver house. I was downwind from them so I crouched down and snuck up to them until I was about parallel to the beaver house. What I saw was amazing. There were two small Sasquatch that stood about three to four feet high. They were using the beaver house as a slide. At first when I saw them I thought they were trying to get into the beaver house. What they were doing was putting mud on the side of the beaver house and no shit they were sliding down it. I did the best that I could to sneak out of there. When I thought I was out of there, line of sight, I put a bullet in the chamber. Then I was on full alert because I couldn't see where the mother was. All I saw were the two juveniles playing. I got to the river by the cabin, and there was a bridge there. I sat in the ditch and lit a smoke and tried to make sense of what I saw. I was looking at the river and then I thought I heard something. I turned to look down the road and I saw what looked like a grizzly bear, but it had no snout. They must have known that I was going to turn and look at it. When it turned and walked into the ditch, it was about 30 feet from me. I couldn't even hear it when it walked into the trees. Willows. Now I'm effing freaked out. I got back, I got up, backed across the bridge, then I ran to the cabin. I sat in the cabin trying to make sense of what I saw. I couldn't have been a grizzly bear because there was no snout and it stood over five feet on all fours that would have been, that would have to have been the biggest grizzly of all time. It finally came to me what I saw was a female Sasquatch with her two babies. I remember everything just like it was yesterday. I was connected to the three of them from that time until the winter of 2016. I was able to take my Uncle Bobby out on the trap line and sponsor the whole winter out sponsor the whole winter out there for him. Spend the whole winter out there probably? I will tell you that another time. When I was a young boy, a demon attached itself to me. I, I lived with that until I was 32. It was Jesus that saved my life. And I've seen heaven once and seen heaven's gate another time. My girlfriend and my best friend and I seen a UFO during a winter storm once. I was broke down on a back road and it was just above the trees, 40 feet from us. This is what I tell people, God is real and Jesus is alive. I've seen the devil and I've seen Jesus and they're real and I chose Jesus, amen. I found this on the web, it's the closest picture I have to what I saw. Use my name, Barry Allen Ferguson. Well, that's kind of different, isn't it? I'll post that picture up and uh, Barry, thanks. Thanks for that share, man. Thanks for going out of your way to share all that, those parts of your life and your knowledge of what you've seen, all right? I found that very interesting. And um, we both know these things are very real. Almost every one of us knows they're very real, right? Um, if whatever you have, whatever knowledge experiences you have, Barry, send them in to me, all right? Whenever you get time, blast it off and send it over, share it with the people through me, okay? And uh, because we want to hear it all. We want to hear everything. Mainstream, mainstream media. Hopefully this is the beginning of the death for mainstream media. It's giving the people their voice back. That's how you get true knowledge. There's no other way. There's, unless you experience it absolute firsthand, learn on your own, there's no other way known today to get true, honest information but from you, from the people. That's the only way. And that's the only way to get the calmness of our so-called communities and societies back, right? Community is being absolutely torn apart and shredded intentionally by mainstream media today, every day, all day. Prove me wrong. And it needs to come to an end now. If I, could have, if I had my way, I would put the owners of all mainstream media on the top 10 most wanted list and I'd throw them all in Gitmo for the rest of their life and I wouldn't even leave them soap. I'd let them sit there in cells and smell each other till the end of time. That's just me. Anyway, 
I better shut myself off here before I get going, <laughs> right? Thanks again, Barry. Make sure you send more, all right? I, my interest peaks even more when I hear knowledge being shared from our indigenous people from, from the various lands. Um, that's the, the indigenous people have been shared their past history verbally <clears throat> through the generations and uh, I almost envy them in that way because our history, the majority of the history of the so-called Western world has been a lie. Lie. So I especially look forward to hearing from our indigenous peoples when it comes to first-hand knowledge of what's going on on the face of this planet today. That's just me. Talk to you guys shortly.